Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, Liquidware, and Policy Pack Software. If you enjoy the show each week, you've them to thank. And now for some news. On last week's episode of the podcast, I talked a little bit about an update to the Citrix Workspace app. This week, Citrix published an article on a vulnerability, CVE-2020-8207. This vulnerability is said to be a remote code execution vulnerability. It is said to only exist if Citrix Workspace app was installed using an account with local or domain admin privileges. It does not exist when a standard Windows user installed Citrix Workspace app for Windows. So it's safe to say that this is going to affect the majority of organizations who have deployed the Citrix Workspace app because I believe most deployment tools still put the service account as a local admin and most people using their own personal machines, they get it out of the box and there's only going to be one account on the machine and it's going to be local admin as well. A remote compromise is only possible when the user has enabled Windows File Sharing or SMB and only when the updater service is running. If authentication is required for SMB, then an attacker must be able to authenticate before they could exploit this issue. Users who have automatic updates enabled and applied should have already been updated to a fixed version. The vulnerability affects Citrix Workspace app for Windows version 1912 LTSR, so get to see you one, and also Citrix Workspace app for Windows 2002, so get to 2006. Over recent years, Apple has been a bit of a blocker to the widespread use of key-based two-factor authentication solutions that leverage Google's advanced protection platform, our app, such as those from Ubico, as they had limited their support for Bluetooth keys, which Ubico, for example, don't provide, and which, as you might expect, are susceptible to underlying vulnerabilities within Bluetooth itself. Apple have not previously embraced Google's app that is a driver for this tech, as importantly, there is no dependency on SMS, which can be intercepted through SIM swapping, or Bluetooth, as already mentioned, is not a requirement and that's vulnerable as well. So Google's app or advanced protection program makes the use of such keys much more secure by eliminating those security holes. Well, the good news is that Apple now supports the use of non-Bluetooth keys to log into app accounts on their operating systems and devices. But unfortunately, this is also in a somewhat limited capacity. Ars Technica have suggested that without the benefits of Apple's APIs, this security key two-factor authentication for iOS and iPadOS works only after a user has signed into the account outside of Chrome through Gmail or another Google app or directly in Safari. So that's a shame. There's a pretty large workflow or usability gap in order to get it to work. Apple, with their tendency to build their own stuff from the ground up, seems to be a detriment to security in this case. It's understandable that they remain protective over their ecosystem, but in these challenging times from a security perspective, these hardware keys are the most safe authentication protection available. It would be great if they could get on board in a greater way. This week, News18.com have reported that seven Hong Kong-based VPN providers have had data leaks. That includes UFO VPN, Fast VPN, Free VPN, Super VPN, Flash VPN, Secure VPN, and Rabbit VPN. These services claim to have as many as 20 million users around the world, and researchers have discovered that the data of potentially all of the 20 million users has been leaked online. VPN Mentor, the research team who published their findings, discovered personally identifiable information data collected by these VPN apps leaked online, including data from those VPN providers who sell their service based on being a no-log VPN. The VPN Mentor research team says they have reached out to all of the VPN app developers who are listed here, and also the Hong Kong's Computer Emergency Response Team with the details. 
The article on news18.com starts with the sentence, VPNs aren't as secure as you may imagine. Of course, this being a tech podcast, I'm sure everyone listening would know better than to think VPNs are secure. If you rely on a VPN service for personal use, maybe to get UK or US streaming services where you are, it may be time to rethink that. If your organization uses a private VPN on like full client machines or worse yet, allows it on people's own personal machines, it's a good time to rethink that too. It's obviously not quite the same thing, but still, in my opinion, it's time to move on from the dark ages of VPN. If you're going to rely on VPN, don't assume security on the network layer alone. Secure your apps, desktops, and data too. I would suggest something like ThinScale's Secure Remote Worker with a VPN is a much better alternative than just allowing something like Cisco AnyConnect or Global Protect VPN to go onto users' personal machines and just opening up your network to everything that happens to be on their machine. According to a recent article from ZDNet, 15 out of 28 desktop PDF viewer applications are vulnerable to a new attack that lets malicious threat actors modify the content of digitally signed PDF documents. So you might assume that if it's digitally signed, that means it's just secure by nature of the fact it's signed, but uh uh-oh, not with this vulnerability. In fact, based on the chart that they show in the article, which I'll share with this episode, which is episode 134, and you'll find it on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links. But according to the chart, almost all PDF products on the market are at least partially vulnerable, with the exception of Master PDF Editor, PDF Editor 6 Pro, and PDF Element. The attack in question is a shadow attack, and it's tracked with CVE-2020-9592, and 9596. A shadow attack is when a threat actor prepares a document with different layers and sends it to a victim. The victim digitally signs the document with a benign layer on top, but when the attacker receives it, they just change the visible layer to another layer. Because the layer was included in the original document that the victim signed, changing the layer's visibility does not break the cryptographic signature and allows the attacker to use the legally binding document for nefarious actions, such as replacing the payment recipient or sum in a PDF payment order or altering contract clauses. So essentially, they're shifting the layer where the signature is and modifying another layer and layering it in on top so no one's the wiser that the document has actually been modified. The article suggests that researchers did reach out and give the PDF app makers a heads up. It doesn't state which, if any, did not patch their products to address the vulnerability, and it just states that you should update your product of choice as soon as possible. So hopefully they've all patched against it. Slack has filed an antitrust complaint against Microsoft in the European Union, accusing them of unfairly bundling Teams with its cloud-based productivity suite, so Office 365. According to TechCrunch.com, quote, Microsoft has illegally tied its Teams product into its market-dominant Office productivity suite, force installing it for millions, blocking its removal, and hiding the true cost to enterprise customers. End quote, according to this TechCrunch.com article, which features a statement from Slack. In other comments, Slack executives said they're asking EU regulators to move quickly to ensure Microsoft cannot continue to illegally leverage its power from one market to another by bundling or tying products together. Slack have suggested that they want them to be forced to sell teams separately to Microsoft 365 customers at a separate price rather than bundling with the existing suite and absorbing the cost. Now bear with me for this next part because it's a bit of a back and forth from Slack and Microsoft in the means of statements. So in a press statement about the team's complaint, Jonathan Prince, who's the VP of communications and policy at Slack, stated, quote, We're confident that we win on the merits of our product, but we can't ignore illegal behavior that deprives customers of access to the tools and solutions they want. Slack threatens Microsoft's hold on business email, the cornerstone of Office, which means Slack threatens Microsoft's lock on enterprise software, 
end quote. And Microsoft also provided a comment to TechCrunch saying, quote, we created teams to combine the ability to collaborate with the ability to connect via video because that's what people want. With COVID-19, the market has embraced teams in record numbers while Slack suffered from its absence of video conferencing. We're committed to offering customers not only the best of new innovation, but a wide variety of choice in how they purchase and use the product. We look forward to providing additional information to the European Commission and answering any questions they may have." End quote. So maybe I'm too old and just don't get it, but I'm not so sure that Slack or Teams are quite the email disruptors that Slack appear to suggest. I get the fact that these tools replace some email communications, but we've had IM capabilities for a long time and all Teams really is to me is Skype merged with SharePoint, both of which existed long before Slack. It did definitely read like it was a dig from Microsoft to Slack on the lack of video conferencing within their product, which it's kind of a fair point because that's the main feature that people start to leverage and that's why Zoom in particular took off during the COVID-19 work from home surge. Now I will say I kind of understand the angle of trying to ensure Microsoft doesn't get to extend its email dominance into new mediums completely unchecked. So I wonder if they'll also bring a complaint against Google for their Meet Now product since they're quite dominant in the email market as well with Gmail and G Suite. I kind of doubt it though. The browser anti-competition complaint of years past didn't seem to go after Google or Apple who also shipped their own default browsers in their operating systems, only Microsoft. It does seem like a pretty valid complaint though. I could see how it would make it difficult for competitors like Slack, for example, when Microsoft has had a lock for so long over Outlook and is pretty much a lock going forward by getting so many enterprise customers onto Office 365 with incentives and attractive pricing. It'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. This week, Dropbox announced they will be joining something called Next Chapter, which is an apprenticeship program co-created by Slack, which focuses on bringing formerly incarcerated individuals into highly skilled engineering roles. The apprenticeships are set to begin in autumn and combines financial support, education, professional and technical mentorship, and re-entry services provided by Dropbox. It's not necessarily directly impacting to enterprise IT people, I know, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Obviously, Slack, Dropbox, and some others will be giving former inmates a chance on re-entry, which is good. And I know a couple of years ago, Google announced their intention to start hiring more non-college educated candidates. It's good to see that some companies are starting to value different backgrounds and experiences and skill sets, which will hopefully lead to a more inclusive and less cliquish and type A group mentality in tech workspaces in future. Either that or we'll just all end up changing these more personal, free-thinking people into awkward geeks with god complexes like the rest of us. That's a joke. I know. Not everyone is like that, okay? Don't at me, as they say. Microsoft is now supporting the EVD edition of Windows 10 2004. That is, of course, the multi-user session version of Windows 10 in the Azure Gallery. In the final news item, I'd just like to say congratulations to Cameo and Brad Rowland. Brad was just announced as a board advisor for Cameo. Brad was formerly with FSLogix and CloudJumper, and he's a good guy to follow in the industry, not only because he's a really nice guy, but also because he seems to have an eye on great tech and great companies if you look at his track record. So congratulations again, and best of luck. And now, a weekly webinar. Based on a poll that was run during the E2EVC digital event, it seemed that ControlUp is a dominant force in the monitoring and management framework tool business for Citrix admins and engineers, at least for those attending that E2E event. A few months ago, they launched Scout Bees, a new service that allows you to proactively monitor the health of your most critical business applications. ControlUp will be holding a webinar on July 30th showing off the product at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. 
And you don't just have to be a control up customer to get value out of this. It is a separate product. And interestingly, there is a free version for personal use if you want to try it out in your lab. Personally, I have not had the time yet to dive into it too much. I intend to try it out and also to get into this webinar to give myself a leg up and a start. From what I recall when I looked into it, my impression was that it could be handy for me for having an active test running from multiple locations and getting an idea if there are connectivity issues that may be affecting external users or more importantly for me at least, if someone's reporting connectivity issues to me from their home, if the bees connecting from a hive at the time are not showing connectivity issues, then it indicates it's more likely that the individual reporting the connectivity issues is having a problem with their ISP or, or their home network in some way. So I'll share a link to register for that webinar with this episode, which again is episode 134 on fivebytespodcast.com under reference links. And now this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. Pascal Berger on Workplace Ninja's site shared an excellent step-by-step -step detailed blog post on how you can deliver fonts with your MSIX packages that are system-wide, meaning they aren't just visible within the MSIX app itself, they're accessible by other applications on your machine too. Excellent job, Pascal. Thomas Preschel shared a blog post on the Citrix ADC native one-time password feature. The post may be especially interesting if you have no other OTP integrations, such as with RSA, for example, in your environment, or if you want to start with OTP or multi-factor without investing a lot of money. So check out this post if you're a Citrix ADC customer who's interested in OTP and getting started. The awesome Chrissy Lemaire, who, by the way, is an excellent follow on Twitter, so go out there and follow her, shared a really cool retro theme for Windows Terminal. If you are on Windows 10 2004 and haven't given the terminal a try yet, you should. It's pretty convenient having CMD and PowerShell in a single app. Also, having multiple tabs is really, really powerful and useful too. And you get to customize it with these cool themes like this one from Chrissy. It's another week and another tip from Thorsten, so thanks Thorsten, who tweeted about dipping into regular expressions and who recommends anyone interested to try, to try regex 101.com, which is really regex101.com, but you know, the saying is 101. Uh. Anyway, he says it's the best online regex debugger and highlights for PHP, PCRE, Python, Golang, and JavaScript. It's been years personally since I have been active day to day with scripting. It tends to be something I do as I need now, but I always found regular expressions to be kind of a chore. I must go back into it because it seems like it's getting more popular, at least based on my Twitter timeline. And finally, ControlUp again. ControlUp have made their popular Analyze User Logon script available for use by anyone. No need to have ControlUp to run the script. You don't have to run it as a script-based action within the console anymore, or even be a paying customer. The script was developed originally by Guy Leach, I believe, and I think he got some collaboration more recently from Trent Tai. The script is a killer. It helps you ascertain what a user's true logon duration is, and it's really useful because it doesn't have to measure at time of the logon. You can just point it at a user session and get the logon. That's it for another episode. Thank you all so much for listening. If you feel like it, I'd appreciate it if you could rate the podcast on your podcast platform of choice, like Apple Podcasts or whatever you tend to listen on. Thanks so much.